This is my theory on what happened to Officer O'Keefe in 2022. It is the end of January and Massachusetts is expecting a blizzard. And there's a cop in New York who lost his life in the line of service. So every cop in New England is in New York for a funeral, including Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, and Kevin Albert. They all decide to come home early because there's a blizzard. I have a theory that while they were in this car, they had a little chat. And the chat would have to do with Sandra Birchmore. See, there's a town about a five minute drive from Canton called Stoughton. And in that town, those cops are even worse than Canton, if you can believe it. Because what they do is they groom girls from their Explorer program when they're around 13 and then they abuse them and pass them around as long as they can get away with it. And that's what they did to Sandra Birchmore until she got pregnant. When Sandra got pregnant at the same time that the cop who began grooming her's wife was in labor, Sandra Birchmore would not be alive to see that baby be born because she allegedly committed suicide in her Canton apartment. So Officer Link, you know him from the Karen retrial. He's the first one at her crime scene. Suicide, nothing to see here, moving right along. Except the town isn't okay with that. No one around is okay with that because they know the story of Sandra. They know that cops have been investigated for having relations with this girl. What the heck is going on, seriously? So let me bring this back to Officer O'Keefe. Officer O'Keefe's sister and brother-in-law passed away. And at the time, John O'Keefe was a Boston cop, a bachelor, and he was living a pretty fast life. But when his, he becomes the guardian of his niece and nephew, he changes that. He switches gears a bit. He's no longer the bachelor party guy. He doesn't even keep his cop job to that extent, he switches it to a desk job. Now he works for the sex offender registry. Went from a you know a single single, the bachelor lifestyle living in Boston to moving into instant dad role. So I think when Sandra Birchmore, when the community uproars about Sandra, of course, John O'Keefe is one of the cops who is going to have information about this. It will have come across his desk these names. And I think that John O'Keefe was a good cop. Maybe that's my bias because he's no longer with us, but I'm gonna go ahead and say he was a good cop and he was willing to question other cops. I'll go ahead and call him the Serpico of the bunch, which is why he gets treated like he gets treated. So I think they're on their way back from New York. They're having a little chat about Sandra Birchmore, about the issues that this is about to raise up, and John O'Keefe and how he's freaking got all these questions and he is ruffling too many feathers and they need to stop it. They need to put a stop to it. They need to uh, scare this guy. Let him know who he's dealing with. See, they don't really know him. They just know him as the guy who adopted the kids. He's friends with the wives, not the husbands. So if John's asking too many questions, Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, Kevin Albert, Link, uh, the proctor, the police chief, these are people that would be intimately involved in the enabling of fellow officers to treat Sandra in such a way. To, maybe they were some of the officers. They either knew or they let it happen. And they, the quilt that they're under is... It encompasses, um, I think, a lot of them, and that's how the, there's a relation between these two cases. So on the drive back, they decide they are going to scare the shit out of John O'Keefe one way or another. And I think the storm is going to act as their cover. I think this is what they used for Sandra. S uh, Sandra Birchmore dies at the beginning of February 2021, a year before this, in the midst of a blizzard. And the blizzard slowed everything down.
It's almost like in New England, if there's a blizzard and you're investigating a murder, all bets are off. You can use solo cups, stop and shop bags. There doesn't need to be red evidence tape. You don't have to secure a crime scene. Hell, you don't even have to make a crime scene. You can be recused from the case and continue working the case in New England, as long as there's a blizzard. It makes no sense. Usually they pull out all the stops because a cop is dead. But this cop wasn't a big deal. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that the homeowner is a Boston cop. I'm sure the owner of the house will receive some shit. And what is it that you respond? Uh, my first response was, nope, um, homeowner is a Boston cop too. Zero. So Karen says she pulls up that night after the restaurant or after the bar, drops John O'Keefe off. He runs up to the door. She's waiting outside to find out if he's going to stay, if there really was an invite to everyone. So I pull at the foot of the driveway. It's snowing. John has no coat on. It's windy. So I drop him off. He goes up the driveway and approaches the side door. And as I see him approach the door, I look down at my phone. A car pulls up behind her at the same time. That's Ricky, Ryan, and Heather. 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 Well, we let the the other car that was coming from the opposite direction. We let them take a right onto the street first. We yielded to them. From the time that Ricky yields to that car coming in the opposite direction, and the time that you pull up to the house. Was that SUV in front of uh, Ricky's truck for the entire time? Yes. Um, and where was it that Ricky parked uh, the truck in relation to the house? Right outside the house, probably a little past the mailbox, past the driveway. She pulls up to accommodate them. Jen McCabe says she sees that. She says she sees her pull up. She sees the two second car. She went over to the storm door and looked out, what if anything did you see? Um, I saw a vehicle. And can you describe the vehicle that you saw? Uh, I saw a dark SUV. And as far as Ms. Nagel, did you make any observations of where she was when you looked outside? I kind of just looked at the vehicle and then I saw, I saw, um, there was, I saw lights kind of over to this side. Um, but then once I saw the vehicle, I took out my phone and I texted John. <clears throat> Julie Nagel runs outside because that second car is her ride picking her up. Um, so I think they pass. I think these are like what happens here is they're like ships passing in the night. They, um, Karen drops him off. He runs up to the main front door of the house. He's never been there before. He's using the main door. It's also where Jen says she's looking out from to see if he's there. Julie says she looks out the window, sees her brother, goes out the side door. So they're like ships passing in the night. They don't see each other. I think Jen opens the door for O'Keefe, goes, hey, you made it. Um, come downstairs. The boys are downstairs. Points him towards the basement. He starts going to the basement. That's it. She turns around. She's hanging out with the girls. Julie comes in, I can give you a ride, blah, blah, blah. She looks out, Karen is still there. There's only one car there. She's pulled up a little now, again, not for the second time because she's just, she doesn't know if she should leave or what. John doesn't come out. He never texts her back. He never says anything. She's tired of waiting and she goes home. I texted him, I called him and within minutes of him exiting my car is not answering his phone, minutes. Hmm. So what, I, what, what happens next? I left. She can't be out there for more than five minutes because she gets to her um, John's Wi-Fi at Meadows by 1236. You had uh, testified on direct examination that uh, Karen Reed's phone connected to the Wi-Fi at One Meadows Ave at approximately 1236 in the morning? Yes, sir. Um, so you can testify based on that that by 12.36 in the morning, uh, Karen Reed was not at 34 Fairview, correct? That's correct. So she goes home. She's connected to the Wi-Fi based on State Trooper Gorino's testimony from day 27, I think. She connects to John's Wi-Fi at 12.36. She is for sure there. There's even a voicemail at 12.41 of her walking around John's house. 
Um, but what Jen says throughout from her first statement until she gets on the stand that she sees John O'Keefe sees the SUV out front of the house at 1240 and then at 1245 sees it drive away. None of that can be true. She's not there. She's driven home. So Jen has let John in, I think is in the basement with the dudes. Who knows if they have words right away and start getting in each other's face. Maybe Higgins asks where John's whore is. Maybe he's ready to have that fight because you know they're about to get into it. The whole point of tonight is to confront him and really just shut him down in some way. And maybe that's going to be telling him that they're fucking his girl or that they will fuck his girl. Or maybe it's something about his kids. Who knows what the plan is, but I think Brian and him are in each other's face having words. And Brian Albert Sr. is letting the dog Chloe back in. As she's passing by the basement stairs, she hears a ruckus. The dude's yelling at each other. She goes down there. She gets three or four good bites in on John O'Keefe's arm before he falls back, hits his head on the side of the weight bench, and is out cold. Of all of the data that you've talked about, all of the information that you were given and reviewed, what is your opinion or conclusion about how these injuries were sustained? I believe that these injuries were sustained by an animal, um, possibly a large dog, because of the pattern of the injuries. Brian... Albert Sr. takes Chloe by the collar and leads her upstairs. When Brian Albert Sr. <clears throat> was walking Chloe from the first floor of that house. He maintained control of Chloe's collar. Did he not? He did, yes. After he puts Chloe upstairs, he comes back down and he gestures to the wives come to the basement. We've got a problem. Where, uh, where did anybody else go sort of around your house? Or house? Um, I know at one point um, my husband and his friend Brian were in our family room. Uh, so I kind of went in there and was talking to them. Next thing you know, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Jen McCabe, and Matt McCabe are standing over John O'Keefe's lifeless body. What the hell are we supposed to do now? So years of these wine moms watching true crime, some decisions were made pretty quickly here. They decided they would all go home and do nothing, say he never made it in the house, and pretend that a snowplow hit him. We're going to go with that, bring him out the back door. Once we're all gone, we're on our way out shortly. The girls don't even know we're down here. They have no idea what happened. We got to go. Get rid of this dog. Take a shoe off. If you got hit by a car, you won't have a shoe. Get a glass. Find a glass. Break it. Put it in his hand. They kind of hang out for another, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. And she tells Caitlin, you got to go. Everyone has to go. Caitlin's like, I was going to spend the night here. What are you talking about? She's like, nope. The reason that you stayed is you wanted to go back to the 34 Fairview, your old home, to be there by midnight when your brother was turning 23, correct? Not necessarily. I, I, my plan was always to stay and um, just spend some time with my mom and my aunt. Um, but Tristan left very early because he knew that he was going to have to be up at three o'clock in the morning, shoveling or plowing. Um, so I, my plan was never to go back with him. Um, but it wasn't necessarily because it was my brother's birthday. It was just what my plan was for the night. Uh, sir. Call your boyfriend. Can you take Chloe? Everyone has to go. And they all start leaving. Once everyone is gone, they are free to take officer O'Keefe's body up through and out the bulkhead in the basement through the backyard side gate and put him on the grass. Their idea is that he was hit by a snowplow. They expect that snowplow driver to be by any moment. And 
if they calculate it right, he'll either hit him himself or he'll at least call it in and then no one's out in the front yard when this goes down. Okay, got it. Jen's at home going, oh my gosh. Our story is really that we're going to say a man just fell out of the sky. That's what we're going with. She can't believe it, but she's a psycho. So in her mind, all she can think of She's a psycho and she Googles it. To get the song out of your head, you know what you have to do? You have to listen to it till the end. Everyone knows that. So old Crazy McCabe, in order to shut her brain down, she's going to listen to the song. But that's even not enough. Her brain won't shut the fuck up, so now she's got to Google. He's not going to die out there, right? No, it's... The plow is going to come by probably within the hour. He'll be out there maybe two hours. They'll get him some medical attention. Bada bing, bada boom. Let me Google this up. How long to take, how long to die in the cold? And as she hits send, she realized what she did. Oh my God. Her IT husband is sitting right next to her. He is going to kill her. She did the thing. She tried to cover up a murder and then she goes home and she freaking Googles about it. She sends a message to her sister and then to the group chat with, that has her, her husband, Brian, and Nicole in it. And then she goes to sleep to wait for the snowplow to make the call. You didn't pick anybody up by the name of John O'Keefe, did you? John O'Keefe? Yeah, he's a Boston cop and he would be on foot, but... No. Uh, I think he probably got a ride and passed out at someone's house. I don't know, but... Yep, no, we didn't lock anybody up or anything. And then their phones start ringing. And it is not who they thought it was. It's Karen Reed. What the hell is she doing calling? Does she know? Did the cops call her? Had they found his body on the side of the road, stuck to a snowplow? Tragic accident that could have could have been avoided? Had anyone just seen him out there? Maybe he slipped and fell. They never thought that Karen was going to show up in the morning because they have John O'Keefe's phone. They know that the one of the last messages that Karen sends John O'Keefe is, fuck off, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something to the effect of, you're a pervert, fuck off, your kids are home alone, I'm home, I went home, and your kids are fucking alone. They think, based on text messages, that Karen is in Mansfield at 6 a.m., they find John's body. By 6.45, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, Jen and Matt McCabe and Nicole Albert are all back at 34 Fairview having their little powwow try to figure out what the hell they're going to say now. Because it went from he never came into this house to pretty sure Karen did it. And I think that happens because in the morning, when Karen goes to look for John, she backs into John O'Keefe's car. She drives around by a couple bars. Just gonna drive around in the two square miles that we spent the preceding night. Ends up going over to Jen's house. Carrie shows up. They say she can't. Karen can't drive. Karen, you can't drive. We'll take one car. Let's take this car back to John's. We'll look for him. Then we'll all get in one car and we'll finish this together. So Karen gets out of her car to let Jen drive. I think she passes by her just cracked taillight and goes, I had told both Jen and Carrie that I cracked my taillight. I said, I just hit my car on top of everything, but I didn't look at the damage. And both women said, it's cracked. It's cracked. Calm down. You cracked your taillight. You're okay. Let's go look for John. So after they take John O'Keefe to the hospital, they drive him away on the ambulance. Then Karen convinces Carrie to take her to the hospital as well. They leave. They're only a few minutes away when they get a call back. And it's the police saying, nope, she needs to come back. We've got a call. Her parents want to take her to the hospital for a mental evaluation because she says she's suicidal. So as you bring her back, she gets into an ambulance. They take her to the hospital as well. It should be noted that this time the lights are on in the Albert home. 
Brian is awake, Nicole is awake, Jen is inside, and nobody has come outside. He's going to say, it's because there were no first responders. I didn't think they needed me. There is. There's an ambulance there that's about to take Karen away. There are plenty of people still outside around this time. He just doesn't go out there for some reason. When you looked out your window uh, from your bedroom, um, what did you see? I could see um, at least one police vehicle. I could see that there was something going on out front. And um, that was about it. And I just went straight downstairs. At that time that you looked out your window, did you see either an ambulance or a fire truck out there? I don't remember if I saw an ambulance. There were emergency vehicles out there, but I can't remember exactly which, which types. Mary is on her way to go get the O'Keefe's. They're all heading to the hospital. On the drive, they're on the phone. Subsequent drive from Braintree to Brockton. Who, if anyone else, did you speak to over the phone? And Karen called me repeatedly from the ambulance asking if I was going to come to the hospital. And she called when the O'Keefe's were in the car um, and said she dropped him off at a party. And Mrs. O'Keefe said, you just left him. And Mr. O'Keefe said, leave her alone. She's been through enough. So immediately the mom is starting to blame Karen. It's 630 in the morning. The, the officer O'Keefe is pronounced dead by just before eight o'clock. They go in, they see his body. By 8.15, they le they're regrouping in the waiting room trying to figure out what their next move is. According to Jen, Carrie's giving them updates from the hospital. So when I came out, they were being called in by Dr. Rice, and I sat in the waiting area. To see how John was doing. Now, you had mentioned uh, at some point, did you speak to Ms. Roberts that morning in regard to updates as far as how John was doing? Yes. All the friends know that he's actually passed. It's not just John hit his head and they were able to get medical attention. Nope. Now it's John hit his head, he bled out, and he's dead. That turns the heat up on everyone. And they start saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to say? And I think this is when Jen's like, you know, Karen is saying she was questioning if she hit him. We'll just say she hit him. We'll just say that she was saying it over and over and over again. And so by nine o'clock, she calls one of the officers. She's like, I've remembered something. When Paul O'Keefe, Officer O'Keefe's brother, is leaving the hospital, Karen is still being restrained for a 5150 hold. She doesn't know what's happened to John. Nobody's telling her anything. She's calling Carrie. Carrie won't answer. No one's answering. No one knows anything. What does Paul O'Keefe do? And if I could just take you back for a moment. So as you exit the room where your brother is and you come back out in the hallway, what, if anything, occurred at that point? Again, we saw um, Karen Reed um, being restrained by hospital employees saying, screaming the same things, is he alive, is he alive, is he alive? Did you at any point, either before or after, respond to any of that screaming that you heard from the defendant? I actually blew her a kiss. Then he goes home and he says, the mom is saying, do you think she has something to do with this? We figured it out as soon as she left the house that day when she came over. We didn't talk to any investigators, state police, nobody. You know, my mother had said, do you think she has something to do with this? And I said, we're not gonna think like that. Went outside to the driveway to look at her car and her car was gone. It was a blizzard. Paul is saying, no, let's not even think that way. And the reason that the mom is saying that is because it's one o'clock now. Karen shows up. She's got out of her 5150 hold. She asked if she can come over to see the kids. She comes over. Patrick just shows up at the same time. He's like 12 years old. He shows up. She sits down with Patrick to let him know that John's dead. I mean... Holy shit. It's traumatic just to probably even hear the words for her own self, but to have to be there when a child hears it, I can't even. She goes upstairs, probably numb, grabs some of her things and leaves. And she's like, holy crap, we're not dating. There goes that whole chapter of my life. I'll probably never see them again. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. And her parents are probably like, yeah, Karen, knock it off. You guys weren't that happy. You were probably going to break up. You were thinking about seeing other people. You have to remember it wasn't all good. It's not perfect. You're just in a state of shock. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. 
she drives away with her parents. She calls Aaron O'Keefe and she's saying some of the similar things. Like, I'll probably never see you guys again. The, um, having to remember the bad times, what, if anything else, did she say to you at that point during that phone call? She said, I don't think I'm ever going to see you guys again. And I said, of course you will. We're friends. But Aaron doesn't hear it that way. Aaron hears it as, what? She's never going to see us again? Remember the bad times? Like, what the shit? Who says this? This is a murderer. So she gets off the phone and she tells Paul. And Paul's like, what? This is weird. He said, and this is a conversation where he was like, I fucking, we knew it before, but we really know it now. So they go out to check her car. To check, did she really hit him? But her car's gone. And now that they know that she has taken that murder weapon and left, they, it's just, they, he, he just knows. So Paul O'Keefe doesn't even, let me just walk you through this. He drives back to his brother's house. He parks next to, behind his car and next to Karen's car in the driveway. He walks past Karen's car. No one in the whole history of police dispatch, remember their relative is a hospital dispatch, keeping them very well informed with what's going on. Um, again, police officer friends, police coming by, police talking to them nonstop. Never are they told that the car hit him until Carrie starts getting messages from Jen and them around nine o'clock. Around nine o'clock, after they get their story straight, they start sending out the messages. Call Link, let him know she hit him. Call Carrie, let him know she hit him. They know the Aruba story. They know that things aren't perfect because Karen's not been fake. So once they let Carrie loose on the O'Keefe's and on the officers, because Carrie likes to talk, that's just what she does, right? I confronted you with a text message where you said, she's telling them everything. Now it's, well, I may have heard a couple of things. Which is it? No, she was going on and on and on like she does. She just likes to talk. Carrie starts telling them everything got the story out that you're trying to get out through Carrie Roberts. Right? I'll allow that. There is no, there is no story. There's facts and truth on this side. There's no story. The story that you've created is not the truth. Did I create, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, or did you? Everything. And it's perfect because now all the proctor can see is the fact that this woman hated him. They were fighting. She was vicious. She was super jealous. She definitely has the freaking personality to pull this kind of shit off. Were you happy for her? Or were you happy for you and Brian and Matt and Nicole? For me. Another thing I thought was always strange is the Jonah Keith's mom wants Carrie and Jen to get together and write down their timeline. It literally should sound something like this. Um, well, she called me at 5 o'clock a.m. Yeah, and then I went to your house. And then we drove around. And then at 6 a.m. we found John. At 6.30 I went to the parents' house. And at 8 o'clock he was found dead. Their timeline is three hours long. Why they needed to get together and iron out their timeline is bizarre to me. But I think this is the mom saying, figure out when she cheated. Figure out when she was talking, when she was jealous. This is the timeline I think they wanted to try to hammer out. Figure out when did they meet, when did she get jealous, when was John going to break up, like all these things they really honestly couldn't have known and they were grasping to try to figure out. But she repeats this story to Proctor immediately. It's Proctor she's telling everything to. And what's bizarre is that Proctor buys it hook, line, and sinker. I don't know if he's just a dipshit or a willfully ignorant but he believes it so much that proctor interviews marietta before he interviews heather maxson for context heather maxson is the only eyewitness who saw john o'keefe in karen's car with her eyes and then saw Karen's car without John O'Keefe. She's in the truck that pulls up behind Karen Reed that night. Yes, the interior lighting was on. So that's why I had noticed as we were pulling away the female in the driver's side. 
driver's seat. As far as the male passenger that you saw uh, as you were pulling onto the street, could you see him at that point? I did not see any other, any other person, just the female in the driver's seat. She won't get interviewed for months. But Marietta Sullivan, who had words with Karen on vacation, she'll be interviewed within a week. Hello, Ms. Maxson. Hello. Uh, the first time you were ever interviewed about this case uh, by law enforcement was September 1st, 2023. Was that right? Correct. So, you, so it was a full 19 months after the events in question that you were first contacted by law enforcement. Correct. And you gave your statement for the first time at that time. Correct. You were not at 34 Fairview Road in Canton on January 29th, correct? Was not. Yet Trooper Proctor drove all the way to Pembroke to interview you on February 8th of 2022. Did he not? He did. Nothing further. They knew what their narrative was. And they just had to paint it in and make sure that everything was everything. Now, I don't think that everyone was trying to frame someone. I think they heard the stories, found pieces to fit their bias, and just used a big-ass hammer to make things fit. And unfortunately, the detective work was so shitty that there's just no way to come to a guilty on this. Like... With all of their circumstantial stuff, the fact that the evidence bags weren't sealed, the fact that the blood was sitting in an unsealed grocery bag next to the taillight that the officer admits to shattering while taking out. Canton Police Department was allowed to facilitate the removal of that light. Yes. And during the course of the removal of that light, a taillight was broken. Correct? That's correct. And shattered? Yes. Parts of it that were falling onto the ground? I don't think there was anything falling on the ground at that point. <laughs> that is, that's me right there. And that's Trooper Proctor. And so who cares if there's DNA on it? Like the, the botched investigation ruined any hope for any justice for John O'Keefe ever. But maybe he's just that good of a cop. And I keep coming back to this. It's like the voicemail that, that you can hear in the car, the ring cameras that have been pivotal in the Karen connecting to the Wi-Fi. All of these little things have been pretty pivotal. Five DNAs in John's shoe. It's like this officer is almost solving this from the grave. And but he's going to do one better. Is not only going to help solve his own murder, and I'm confident that more stuff will come out um, as we gear up for our, another trial, which I don't, I don't see happening. But I think he's going to help Sandra Birch more as well. Now I don't know what it says about Boston's finest that their best cop is six feet under, but I think it says a lot about the policing system in America as it is. Now, I love America. I love criminal justice. I have Lady Justice tattooed on my back. I love it. I have police officers in my family, and my first love was always criminal justice. I don't think all cops are bastards. I think it only takes one, though, to spoil an entire family of law enforcement and to ruin everything. Because these guys go through a lot together and those things, they stack on and they stack on and it becomes this weight, this weighted blanket that's very, very cozy and comfortable when you're under it. It's also very suffocating when you're subjected to it outside of your will. And I think that they tried to suffocate John with this giant blue quilt and they, I guess they succeeded. But in their silencing, all that happened was the, the souls of these good people, Sandra Birchmore, John O'Keefe, they're rising up and demanding justice. I don't wish for there not to be police in Boston. I just wish that there were good police in Boston because there are good citizens in Boston and they deserve to feel a level of protection from those who, who sign up to do it. 
and after Sandra and John O'Keefe, I can't imagine anyone sleeping peacefully at night. So when it comes to the first responders, the firefighters and EMTs, um, I really don't think that they all are lying. I don't think they all are in on some grand conspiracy. I think it was a hectic situation. Some of them were new. I think they were probably a close, tight group. They told the story to each other. Some parts of the story got confused. And two and a half years later, you know, Nuttall takes a stand to tell us he hears Karen say, you know, I hit him to Katie McLaughlin. But then Katie takes a stand or then Jackson gets him to tell us that he actually was in the ambulance during when she was questioning. And then Katie gets on the stand and she tells us that after she questioned Karen, she goes over to the ambulance to tell them her findings, you know, how old he is, what are his medications and what are the people outside saying? The fact is, it seems like if you watch the testimony, they all thought that she, if she said, did I hit him? Could I have hit him? She's talking about with her fists. He has a black eye. The one firefighter gestures to his face and says something hit him. You indicated that you were not present when your colleague, Katie McLaughlin, was questioning anybody at the scene, correct? Correct. She was tasked with that responsibility, but you did not engage with her. Correct. Meaning, when I say engage with her, you weren't standing there with her. No, I was, no, I was in the back of the ambulance. Okay. Uh, and then I said, she's saying I hit him. And... Uh, Firefighter Nuttall motioned to his face and said something. Objection, Ask another question. They think she hit him with his fist. They think they got into a domestic that night. No one at all is thinking a car is involved. No one thinks Karen's car is involved until Jen McCabe puts that story in Carrie Roberts, who gives it to Paul O'Keefe. And it spreads like the virus that it is and confirmation by, I mean, you could look what they did. Look at this whole trial is finding tiny little pieces that kind of make it make sense. Except for physics. Uh, um, from your testing, what would you expect to do? What would you expect to see in terms of the damage to the right rear taillight? If in fact that taillight were to make contact with a part of a human body, for instance, an elbow and arm, elbow or an arm, at 15 miles an hour or above, what would the level of damage be as compared to the damage that you actually saw? Well, if, if we compare it to, uh, again, looking at the, the drop test that we did with the hybrid head, which weighs about 10 pounds. So again, if we're talking about now a human arm that's comparable in that same weight, uh, we certainly would expect to see a comparable level of force and damage. So as I mentioned, uh, if the arm is outstretched um, across the, the right tail lamp and into the lift gate section, I would certainly expect to see deformation to that body paneling, even potentially the tail light. Um, on the lift gate itself and that chrome piece as well. So was the taillight damage consistent or inconsistent with striking an arm? It was, our findings was it's, it's inconsistent for a number of reasons, um, but it, it's inconsistent with striking the arm, yes, sir. Okay. Was the head injury that you saw consistent with falling backward from a standing position onto a rigid surface? That's certainly one of the one of the possible scenarios that would create the injury mechanism. You fall backwards, strike your head on concrete, that can produce thousands of pounds of force. That kind, of, those kinds of force multipliers require a hard or rigid surface, or not? They do, yes, sir. So grass and dirt would not produce the same sort of force. Grass and dirt, no, that would not certainly not produce the same amount of force as, as hitting your head on concrete. No. And if it was grass and dirt with a little bit of snow on the top of it, what effect is that? That's going to dampen uh, and lessen the force even more so. Talking about the arm, if presuming a strike at, say, 24 miles an hour on just the arm, what kind of damage would you expect to see on the arm, irrespective of the, of the vehicle? You can see significant damage uh, on the arm, especially if, if it hits at that taillight. Um, enough force to actually cause fracture of, of that taillight, that force is going to be concentrated at an initial point. And you're going to see at that point, you're going to see probably the most damage to the arm and to the skin there. So remember, at, at 15 miles an hour, that's about almost 1,000 pounds. So a 24, 25, it's even greater. So that amount of force on the arm, um, certainly you're going to see extensive uh, 
subcutaneous lacerations, uh, bruising, contusions, you're going to see most likely fracture of the arm as well. Uh, you're going to see significant damage. Just imagine having your arm out and, and being struck by a car at 25 miles an hour. There's going to be significant damage, more so compared to uh, the simply the abrasions that, that were diagnosed and documented on, on the arm in this case. Except for science, except for reality, except for time. I mean, she connects to the Wi-Fi at a time that makes it impossible for Jen's story to even be true. In addition to the original report and the supplemental report, here's a copy of the interview notes that Proctor took when he interviewed Jennifer McCabe on January 29th, around one o'clock in the afternoon. And she doesn't say the hidden part. She does repeat the fact that she's adamant that Karen was outside of 34 Fairview at 1240. She says she sees the car and that it's there for about 15 minutes. We know that's a lie. She's connected, Karen is connected to the Wi-Fi at 30, or at One Meadows by 1236. Easy, easy debunked lie. I don't really talk about Colin. I don't even know if Colin was there. Colin doesn't even have to be there for any of this to make sense. It could have totally been Colin. Like there are certain things that make no sense. In the original grand jury testimony, original stories, uh, Chris and Julie Albert tried to place themselves at 34 Fairview. Like, who does that? You know a guy dies here, and you want to put yourself there? But video puts them, puts Julie leaving Waterfall early and Chris walking home. So they have to change their story to be a new alibi for their son. Uh, Ali McCabe's screenshot is clearly doctored. It's clearly not, not real. The date never changes. It's an iPhone. She's lying. Um... And her Life360 puts her in the area again at 1.30 while she says she's in sleep at 12.30. So that's all bullshit. Everything seems like it kind of makes sense until you actually look at it. If you focus on any one piece of Commonwealth evidence, you start to realize that you need to blur your eyes to make this a picture that makes sense. And that's a problem. Like we're talking about reasonable doubt. Karen Reed has to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, so that's my theory, that Brian Higgins was super jealous, that he wanted to bang Karen, and Karen didn't seem interested anymore. When she sees, when he sees her that night at the waterfall, he texts her, um, and then later he'll text John O'Keefe at 1220, asking him if he's coming by. He A conversation begins on uh, what's indicated as uh, Saturday, 1220 a.m., is that correct? Yes. And is it your recollection that that was January 29th? Yes. And is that uh, the message that you sent to Mr. O'Keefe while you were in the residence at 34 Fairview Road? Yes. I said, are you coming here with three, followed by three question marks? And again, Mr. O'Keefe, based on your recollection and based on the records you have before you never responded to that text, is that correct? That's correct. He wants a piece of John O'Keefe, and he's letting the Stoughton cops, the shitty PD, the corrupt Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, he's going to be a bro and punk John O'Keefe because he's, you know, in the sex offender division and has been asking questions about the death of Sandra Birchmore. But I think that Brian Higgins is just going to punk him for the fun of it. Possibly Colin is there. Possibly Colin is a little too big for his britches and he it goes too far the dog pipes up to protect colin who knows who knows why the dog goes off if she was always going to who knows if colin even is here but my theory is they get him to the basement <clears throat> the people in the house are unaware because it's a party atmosphere because they've been drinking since seven um when you open the basement door you can't see into the kitchen it blocks that so I just feel like this was literally the perfect storm. And it's crazy that we get to see it played out for us on live television. I don't trust Proctor as far as I can throw him. And on the screen in front of you that's playing, I'm going to put the jurors came out with, um, first of all, they felt intimidated by having the Alberts sitting in court. Second of all, they came back with a unanimous not guilty on count one and three 
for Karen Reed, um, which I think is important. You know, they get to her the same evidence and they did not find her guilty of murder. Um, and lastly, Proctor, he was immediately after mistrial, he was put on leave. And then yesterday, Monday, January, or July 8th, Monday, he was put on leave without pay. So they finally suspended his pay. And the whole big thing here is due process. It's, it's red evidence tape doesn't exist for the manufacturers. Red evidence tape doesn't exist to make someone's boss happy. Red evidence tape exists to secure a conviction. Every step that a detective is trained and taught to take is to make sure that nothing is contaminated because you want to secure a conviction. There's this old debate that goes on in law and it's, is it better to let one in to lock one innocent man up or to let a hundred guilty men go free? And all said and done when all the chips are down, it's always better to let it, to keep the innocent out of jail. It's not okay to accidentally rob from someone their liberty on a whim. So no, in our country, in America, under the justice system that we love, you're innocent until proven guilty. And the reasonable doubt, every single defense attorney is going to try to find it. It is the detective's job. It is the work of a police force to secure convictions on guilty people. And what they did here, whether Karen Reed is guilty or not, they failed. They failed their jobs. They failed their peers. They failed their citizens. They failed every single person. And more importantly, they failed John O'Keefe, a fellow officer who deserved a thorough investigation into his death and will never, ever, ever get it. What they did with the blood, what they did, what they did with the blood is enough. The fact that it wasn't secure, the fact that they broke the tail light further, the fact that evidence keeps showing up later and later and later it, justice is ruined for John O'Keefe unless somebody comes out and confesses to this. See, Jen just hates Karen. She doesn't even need to do any of this. She's just an awful bitch who hates Karen. Hey, big props to you if you made it to the 40-something minute video, minute mark of this video. I have a little surprise for you. You might know it, you might not, but today... Kevin Albert, remember I told you at the beginning of this video, there were four dudes in the truck driving back from New York. It was Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, um, Kevin Albert, and another dude. Well, Kevin Albert, that's Brian Albert's brother. That's the guy who is calling Brian Higgins and coordinating with the chief um, to stay in on this investigation because he's one of the seven Albert brothers. Anyways, he was suspended without pay today because uh, some shit that has to do with Proctor. I don't know. There's an internal investigation. Listen to the the Canton Select Board right now. I'll tell you about it. Uh, Chief Rafferty has placed Kevin Albert on paid administrative leave while an outside and please be quiet. While an outside independent investigation is being conducted relative to his actions in a case he investigated with Michael Proctor approximately two years ago. Kevin Albert was placed on leave on June 13th and will remain on leave until the results of the investigation are provided by the outside independent investigator. All right. 